This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2020. Lesson 10 for August 29 to September 4, ready for teaching on September 5, an exciting way to get involved, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 29. Before we start, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can share that word and we can be excited about sharing it because it is possible because of the work of the Holy Spirit that we relate to people in a way that they want to know more about you. And that is exciting. As we study your word this week, as we prepare ourselves to share your love and your grace with those around us, we pray that Your Holy Spirit will continue to guide us and bless us in our personal lives too. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Someone has said, There is strength in numbers. In a sense, that is true. Have you ever noticed that you are far more motivated to exercise if you are doing it with a group of people than if you have to exercise alone each day? Many people join health clubs, gyms and exercise facilities because they believe that they will exercise more and enjoy it better if they are exercising with other people. In a similar way, God has created us for fellowship. We are social beings, and, as with exercise, it is true with many things in life. We do better if we have a social support system. This is especially true in spiritual matters. Throughout the Bible, small groups are highlighted as one of God's methods of strengthening our faith, increasing our knowledge of His Word, deepening our prayer life, and equipping us to witness. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit participated in a small group ministry. Jesus established his small group of disciples, and the Apostle Paul travelled the Roman world with his small group of evangelistic companions. During this week's study, we will focus on the biblical basis for small groups, and you will discover an exciting way to get involved. Sunday, August 30. Small Groups, God's Idea First. Question, read Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and verse 26, Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, and Ephesians 3, 8 and 9. How do these verses reveal the unity of the Godhead? Genesis 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the the earth and Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And Ephesians 3, beginning at verse 8, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit participated in creation together. They each had different tasks, but worked together in an, an indivisible union. 
The father was the master designer, the great architect. He carried out his plans through Jesus as the active agent in creation in unison with the power of the Holy Spirit. Such a powerful supernatural act is way beyond our comprehension. What we can clearly comprehend is not only the reality of the created world and the cosmos, but also that God himself made it all, as we read in Romans 1 verses 18 to 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppresses the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Small groups were God's idea first. Though one has to be careful when using analogies in regard to many of the mysterious aspects of God, let's use one loosely and say that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit composed the first small group in salvation history. They participated together in the creation of the human race and then in its redemption after the fall. Question, compare John chapter 10 verses 17 and 18 with Romans 8.11 and 1 Corinthians 15.15. 15. How does the resurrection of Christ demonstrate the unity of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit in the plan of salvation? John 10, beginning at verse 17. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And Romans 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you... He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And 1 Corinthians 15 verse 15. Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are united in a small group with the express purpose of redeeming the human race. As Ellen White writes in Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 186, the plan of salvation had its place in the councils of the infinite from all eternity. End of quote. There is nothing more important to God than saving as many people as possible. As we read in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Small groups may have multiple purposes that we will study in this week's lesson, but their overriding purpose is to focus on winning lost people to Jesus. That is, by working in small groups, we can help not ourselves alone, but others as well. That is, the ultimate goal of our small groups should be soul winning. And to finish the day, dwell on the mystery of the unity of our God. It's hard to grasp, isn't it? Yet, we can still believe in and trust what we don't fully understand, right? Why is this such an important principle for Christians to follow when it comes to faith? Monday, August 31. Small Groups in Scripture The Bible provides numerous examples of small groups praying, fellowshipping, encouraging one another, and labouring together for Christ. 
These groups give God's people the opportunity to share responsibilities and fully utilize their varied gifts. That is, small groups also can provide the opportunity for the Lord to use each of us more fully. Question, read Exodus chapter 18, verses 21 to 25. What providential counsel did Moses' father-in-law Jethro provide that made a significant difference for Moses? Why was this plan so vitally important? Exodus 18, beginning at verse 21. Moreover, you shall select from all the people of Bible men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easy for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all this people will also go to their place in peace. So, Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Every individual in the camp of Israel became part of a group of ten, led by a godly official. These small groups were a place for problem-solving, but they also were much more. They were places of fellowship where problems could be prevented and spiritual life nurtured. They were places of vision where God's plans for Israel could be shared. In groups like this, people could form tight and caring relationships that could help all involved work through whatever the issues were that they were facing. No question, then, as well as now, people struggled with things that others could help them with. Small groups provide opportunities for warm, caring fellowship, spiritual growth and problem-solving. It is interesting that small group specialists tell us that the ideal size for group interaction is between 6 and 12 people. This is the exact size that both Moses and Jesus employed in forming their groups. Question, read Luke 6, verses 12 and 13, Matthew 10, verse 1, and Mark 3, 15, oh, sorry, 13 to 15. What was Jesus' twofold purpose in calling the disciples and selecting them to be part of his small group ministry? First of all, Luke 6 beginning at verse 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. And Matthew 10 verse 1. And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And Mark 3, beginning at verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. Then he appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and cast out demons. Jesus' purpose in calling the disciples was to prepare them both spiritually and practically for their mission to the world. In fellowship with him, they would grow in grace. In the context of their small group meetings, they would learn how to minister more effectively. Day by day, as they observed Jesus ministering to the needs of people around him, they would learn by observation how to use their gifts. The purpose of Jesus' small groups was both spiritual nurture and outreach. And that brings us to our closing thought for today. Think of a time when you were involved in a small group of people, whatever the circumstances, who cared about each other and who were working for a common goal. What did you learn from that experience that could help you understand the value of small groups in the context of your faith?
Tuesday, September 1. Organised for service. Question. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 25. How does the human body provide an excellent illustration of working together harmoniously in small groups? 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not of the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor can the head say to the feet, I know, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honourable, on these we bestow great honour, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honour to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Paul not only reveals the importance of spiritual life in the life of the church, but he also suggests a model of how they can be organised. He discusses spiritual gifts in the context of the body of Christ and how it can work. A study of anatomy and physiology reveals that the organs of the body are organized into different interrelated systems. For example, the digestive, cardiovascular, respiratory and skeletal are just a few of the body's complex organ systems. Spiritual gifts are like the different parts of the body. They function best when organized into systems or groups. In fact, in most cases, they cannot function alone. Our bodies are not just a lump of separate organs freelancing away at whatever they do. Each bodily function is organised into a tightly knit system that works together toward a common goal. All this tells us something about the environment in which we can best use our spiritual gifts. It is so easy to get discouraged when we function alone, but when we are part of a small group of people with similar interests and goals, we find that our efforts can be much better focused and greatly magnified. So, small groups provide the best environment to exercise our spiritual gifts and can become the heart of a local congregation's outreach ministry. Ellen G. White underlines the value of small groups in these words in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 21 and 22. The formation of small companies as a basis of Christian effort has been presented to me by one who cannot err. If there is a large number in the church, let the members be formed into smaller companies to work not only for the church members, but for unbelievers. If in one place there are only two or three who know the truth, let them form themselves into a band of workers. Let them keep their bond of union unbroken, pressing together in love and unity, encouraging one another to advance, each gaining courage and strength from the insistence of the others. End of quote. Small group ministry is ordained by God to enable each church member to grow spiritually, experience warm fellowship and utilise his or her God-given gifts in service. And so to finish today, reflect on Ellen White's statement above, analyse it phrase by phrase. How can this divine counsel be implemented in your church?
Wednesday, September 2, New Testament Small Groups The New Testament Church exploded in growth. In a few short years, it grew from a small group of believers to tens of thousands of worshippers. There were many factors that contributed to this influx of believers and this rapid growth phenomenon. Jesus' ministry sowed the seed of the gospel and prepared the multitudes to accept the preaching of the disciples. After Christ's ascension, the Holy Spirit descended mightily on the day of Pentecost on the praying, believing disciples. One of the contributing factors for the rapid growth of the New Testament Church was its small group organisational structure. Small groups made a difference. Question. Read Acts 18, 1 to 5 and Acts 20, verses 1 to 4. Why do you think Luke listed some of the names of those with whom Paul worked closely? Acts 18, beginning at verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. While Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. And Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. After the uproar had ceased... Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged many with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychius, and Trophimus of Asia. It is fascinating that Luke mentions some of the names of those with whom Paul worked. To him, each one was important. He knew them by name. They mutually supported one another in their outreach ministry. Though the number of names he mentioned was small, that helps prove the point about the importance of working closely with each other, even in small numbers. Each one of these people surely had gifts that were different from those that others possessed. They came from different backgrounds and cultures. Their ways of looking at things were not always the same, but each one had a valuable contribution to make to the cause of Christ. Their diversities of gifts, backgrounds and experiences contributed to the growth of the church. They each contributed to the mission of Christ from the richness of their own background and personal experience with Jesus. Question. Compare Acts 16 verses 11 to 15 and verse 40 and Acts 12 verses 11 and 12. What invitation did Lydia give to Paul immediately after his conversion? Where did both Peter and Paul go after being delivered from prison? Acts 16, beginning at verse 11. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Semithrace, and the next day went to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days, and on the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul, and when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. And verse 40, So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. And Acts chapter 12 beginning at verse 11. 
And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel, and has delivered me from the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together, praying. The New Testament believers regularly met in homes. Christian homes became centres of influence and the heart of small group ministry. So to finish today, have you thought about beginning a small group ministry in your home or joining with a friend to beginning a small group ministry in that person's home? If you are already part of a small group ministry, think about what you can share with your Sabbath school class this week about its benefits. Thursday, September 3. Small Group Dynamics Small groups are a vehicle that God uses to grow His church. They are safe havens for people to express their problems and discuss mutual concerns. They provide opportunities for spiritual growth in the context of caring relationships. Many non-Christians will initially feel more comfortable in participating in a small group meeting in a home than in attending a traditional church service for the first time. Question. Read Acts chapter 4 verse 31, 12 verse 12. 20 verses 17 to 19 and 27 to 32. List all of the different elements in these New Testament groups. What activities were these groups involved in? Acts chapter 4 verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And Acts 12, verse 12, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And Acts 20, verses 17 to 19, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. And the same chapter continuing, verses 27 to 32, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears." So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Early Christians met together to intercede for others, pray about mutual concerns, share in warm fellowship, study the word of God, be equipped for service, help protect each other against false teachers, and participate together in outreach activities. Small groups make a difference. People uniting their gifts in service, focusing on the power of the Holy Spirit for outreach, are a mighty weapon in the Lord's hands. Question. Read Matthew 9, verses 37 and 38. What does Jesus say about the harvest, and what is his solution to the problem? Matthew 9, beginning at verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. The disciples saw only faint possibilities for the progress of the gospel, but Jesus saw great possibilities. He shared the good news with them that, 
The harvest truly is plentiful. And then he pointed out the problem, the labourers are few in Matthew 9.37. Christ's solution was to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. Verse 38. Small groups are an answer to Christ's prayer and exponentially increase the number of labourers for Christ's harvest. The focus of all effective small groups is witness and service. Small group ministry will soon die out if its focus is inward and not outward. If the small group becomes self-serving and little more than a discussion group, it will fail in its purpose and lose the vital reason for its existence. Small groups exist to lead people to Jesus, nurture their faith in Jesus, and equip them to witness for Jesus. And so to finish today, is it possible that God is calling you to start a small group in your home? Why not begin to pray about what God may be impressing you to do? You may be on the verge of the most spiritually rewarding time of your life. Friday, September 4. A number of years ago, a small European church outside of one of the continent's major cities decided that it had to do something significant for the Lord. The church was stagnant. No one had been baptised for years. If the present trend continued, the church had little future. The pastor and his church board earnestly prayed and carefully considered what they might do. As they studied the New Testament, they decided to establish a small group ministry. Nine lay people in the congregation caught the vision. They committed themselves to pray together and study how to establish their small group ministry effectively. Soon, they decided to make each of their homes an evangelistic centre. The groups learned to exercise their gifts in various ways. They launched prayer and hospitality ministries. They developed friendships in the community. They reached out in acts of kindness to their family, friends and to former Adventists. The small group leaders began Bible studies in nine homes with 40 guests in attendance. They were amazed at what the Holy Spirit was doing. Eventually, 17 of the 40 were baptised. The testimony of that small, stagnant church is that small groups make an enormous difference. They are one of God's means to involve multiple church members in the mission of the church. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. In class, discuss further the essential elements in each small group as outlined in Thursday's study. In what other kinds of activities could a small group be involved? What are ways in which a small group could help those with special gifts really be able to use those gifts as never before? 2. Why is it so important that small groups keep an outward mission focus? That is, however much a group can help nourish and support its members, why must it always keep central to its purpose the spreading of the gospel? Why, too, should a small group always keep connected with the local church body? Why is this so important? 3. Have you ever been a part of or heard of small groups that did not function effectively and eventually died out? Discuss the reasons why you think this might happen. 4. Think about the story above, about what happened in Europe with a small group ministry. Why do you think it worked so well? What did they do that was, in many ways, so simple and yet so effective? Why, too, might working from the safer environment of homes, as opposed to a church building, be an effective way of beginning an outreach to the neighbourhood or community? Inside Story, Forgiven in East Timor, by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. 
The would-be killer of a Seventh-day Adventist store clerk won't face punishment after East Timor authorities accepted a decision by the clerk to forgive rather than seek justice in the attack. The case has shocked the East Timor town of Los Palos, where retribution is common and even the police have expressed disbelief that store clerk Edu Wachamura chose to forgive. The attacker, juvenile Ananias, thrust a spear through a store door in a drunken attempt to kill Edu in 2017. The spear only nipped the tip of Edu's nose. Edu met Juvenal in a, at a Las Palos police station in 2019 and signed a declaration to forgive him. Juvenal expressed his remorse for his actions. I am sorry, he said. Thank you. Juvenal offered to slaughter a pig and throw a feast in Edu's honour, but Edu declined, explaining that he doesn't eat pork. Police officers watched incredulously as Edu signed the paper in their presence. You should at least give a gift or a cow to Edu, an officer told Juvenal. The attack, which was featured as a Sabbath school mission story in fourth quarter 2018, occurred after Juvenal drunkenly stumbled into the store and swore at 28-year-old Edu, who was working behind the counter. Edu, who had joined the Adventist church after taking Bible studies from the store's owner, Zalindo Jaole, gently scolded him. Juvenal angrily threatened to kill Edu, but backed off when he saw the other customers in the store. "'I'm going to kill you tonight!' he snarled as he headed out the door. That night, Edu heard a knock on the double metal doors at the back of the shop. He went over to the doors, which were locked and chained together, and looked between them to see who was outside. At that moment, a spear plunged through the doors. In a split second, Edu raised an arm, diverting the course of the spear. The tip of the spear sliced the end of his nose. Two days later, police came to the store to ask Edu whether he wanted the attacker to go to jail. Edu shook his head. I've forgiven the man, he said. The police jailed Juvenile anyway for a week, but then released him. The lengthy legal process played out until 2019 when Juvenal was officially declared forgiven by the authorities. Zalindo hopes that the stunned local community will understand that God wants to forgive them just as Edu forgave Juvenal. Following the attack, Edu's brother and sister were baptised and Zalindo hopes many more people will follow their example. And there's a photograph here on the left. Everyone is talking about Edu's decision to forgive and no one understands it, Zalindo said. It is the power of God. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.